ambulance service as the patient breathing. Being a paramedic is the best job in the world. I love being able to see that I've made a difference in someone's life. Meet the men and women of Scotland's ambulance service. Serving over five million people. Here goes. From the Highlands to the borders. Oh, I'm melting. From busy cities to remote countryside. Wherever we need help. I'm just trying to think how we're going to get down to the boy. Oh, miles away yet. Whatever is wrong with us. Ready, set, lift. You still with me, Lisa? Lisa, go and open your eyes for me. You look as if you've been halfway across the Sahara jump. It's not a way pass out. It's OK, we've got you. It's been the toughest year they've ever known. Just being uniform doesn't mean that we aren't going to catch COVID and we're not <laughs> going to become sick. And they are in demand like never before. That's the only two crews at the moment that are covering this whole area up here. We're under so much pressure, we're so busy, we're exhausted. On the front line, every day and night, Scotland's paramedics keep Scotland safe. Harry, come on, baby. Yeah, it's us. For the ambulance oh. service. And alive. One, two, three, four. OK, don't give up. This is keeping them going to the ambulance crew can get there, OK? This time, navigating the canals of Stirlingshire. Doubtful whether a Wolverine can get across this footbridge here. How to manage the frightening and sudden onset of seizures. Right, and another wee one. I'll wait for you to come out it. And why paramedics and ambulance control need to act quickly when vital new information comes in. There's nothing in the notes to say that she's in the street or that she'd passed out, so I'm going to upgrade the ambulance. On the outskirts of Edinburgh... How tired, here we go. ..the Scottish Ambulance Service's Special Operations and Response Team, or SORT, are on their way to a job. <laughs> Night is falling and someone is stranded off-road. So we're uh, being asked to attend a casualty who's dislocated her knee, apparently, on the side of a canal path near Falkirk about 15 minutes away from any sort of road access, apparently. So uh, we're being asked to support the rescue of this person. A divisional paramedic team are already on scene treating the patient, but to extract her from the canal side, sort resources are needed. It was a summer's evening, but uh, we knew that the, the light would be failing fast, and uh, given the, the fact that they were a distance away from the road access, we knew it was going to be quite dark by the time we either got to the patient or were returning with the patient. We probably wouldn't require a Wolverine vehicle or difficult access vehicle to get along the canal path to make it a bit quicker. I'm trying to get it before it gets darker. There's the crew. Here we are. So we're quite far away. Yeah. How can the yeah? So we've we've got our uh, all-terrain vehicle coming. A four by four all-terrain vehicle, primarily used uh, as a, a sports recreation vehicle. It means that we can get to uh, uh, patients in difficult access situations, up hills and uh, across fields and things like that. Where it saves a lot of carrying and manpower to safely and comfortably carry a patient back to. A proper ambulance. But there's a problem. The road where that we were parked and the ambulances were parked, between that and the canal there was a, a mains railway line. Obviously you can't cross railway lines anywhere safely apart from bridges and underpasses. Could you come across just now? Uh, I want to assess this bridge. Uh, appreciate your input here. So, team leader, yes, yes, uh, made contact with the patient's father. We're assessing the access point from here. Doubtful whether a Wolverine can get across this footbridge here. The bridge to the canal side where the patient is stranded is too narrow for the 4x4 to cross. A paramedic is sent ahead on foot 
whilst Ali and Jason work out how they can secure access for the Wolverine and an exit route for the patient. Right, we'll have a look at uh, other access. So we found underpasses, but they had narrow, there was a, a, a burn running through them with a, a small wooden bridge, which was at, with fences either side. Uh, so we couldn't uh, get through that way. Just when it looks like they're stuck, help appears. A contractor who has been working nearby suggests a road which building crews have used previously. And so then, along this road? We were looking at maps to try and find places and that did seem too far away but and it didn't look suitable but the contractor said that they'd used it for their uh, diggers and things in the past so we knew that we could use it. Rona, this guy's going to show you a, an access point. Okay. If you just follow him, he's going to sort that out. Now, the 4x4 four four can get to the patient, but it's dark and getting colder. She needs to be extracted as soon as possible. In Lanarkshire. It's lunchtime. Paramedic Siobhan and technician Liam are responding to a call from a patient who has been in trouble for several hours. Yeah, approximately 1am this morning. 58 year old male conscious breathing. The twitching has stopped. 999 mode activated. The call is coded purple, which means there is imminent danger to life. Purple call is the, the highest priority of call, so it's going to be either resuscitation, so a cardiac arrest where the patient isn't breathing and the heart isn't beating, or ineffective breathing where the patient isn't breathing effectively to sustain life. Um, so it is obviously it's a, it's a very significant job to attend and it's a job that requires a bit of thinking. Ah, yeah. Right. And he's rigid. Right. So there's something underlying. The patient is called Harry. His wife, Lynn, is worried by the seizures he's been having since the early hours. Right, so he has epileptic. Yes, I the have. Medication's yes. been changed, is that right? Well, let's get in the process. And the process has been changed because of why? What was the reason? Other seizures. He was in a grand mal for over six minutes last week. So the medication, the, the dose of the medication you're on wasn't working effectively, is that really? I think it's actually making them worse because ever since he's been on that, I find a big change in Harry. Epilepsy affects the brain and causes seizures. And he had a seizure this morning, you were saying? He had one at four o'clock this morning. Uh -huh. I gave him a Dazzlam and I gave him the tablet. And then he said two wee ones. Uh -huh. But then this one at four o'clock in cells, he's demanding to go to bed. So he's just wanting to escape now. So there's something underlying. And when was, when was that? Just when you phoned there? Yeah, was just it? when I phoned there about 10 minutes ago. You can get the, the common, uh, the typical tonic clonic seizure where you get full body rigidity. Um, the patient would be would be full body convulsing. They'd be shaking, um, jaw would be clenched, and um, you know it's quite common to bite their tongue. So the blood around the mouth as well. Harry has had these in the past, but his wife thinks his latest seizure is a focal seizure. Was it a full body convulsion? Was it a tonic clonic no, seizure? No, 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 it's a focal seizure. It was a focal seizure. Okay. Focal seizures are a lot more subtle than you know, a tonic clonic seizure. Um, it could be a gaze to the right or the left, or, or a gaze anywhere at all, really. Um, twitching, facial twitching. Um, it could be clicking their fingers. Just something very, very subtle that goes on for the, for a period of time. Also, you don't usually communicate whilst that's ongoing as well. How is it just now to you? Terrible. Mm -hmm. yes, as in right now? Yes, not yourself. That's what I'm saying, could you, you maybe take it to the hospital? Uh, we'll, we'll do an assessment of that and we'll work out what's, what's going on. It's always good to have family there um, who are, are, are well versed on, on what exactly is going on with the patient. Ultimately we arrive and we're, we're trying to take on a lot of information within a short period of time. So it's, it's, it's best to just stand back and listen to the, the people who know best and that is sometimes the family in that case. With the likes of epilepsy, it might be normal for someone to have three seizures back to back and it might be abnormal, so them knowing the difference between what their normal and abnormal is helps us understand better what's going on and helps us better able to treat them. Any other health conditions at all? Yeah, no. How are you feeling just now, Harry? Fine. You know where you are just now? Yes, I'm in the house. You know who we are? 
Uh, yeah. I think you're a paramedic. I think I might, maybe something like that. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Aye, fair enough. Aye. You'll take a wee scratch about your finger. As Siobhan and Liam run through their tests, Harry has another seizure. Harry, 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 Scotland has three ambulance control centres, which process every 999 call in the country. In South Queensferry, clinician Mark checks on patients who are waiting on an ambulance and intervenes if their condition has worsened. Hi there, sorry to bother you. Um, I'm phoning from the ambulance service. I'm one of the paramedic um, advisors. I'm phoning for a 999 call that's been made for this number. The patient, an older woman, has tripped and fallen but Mark quickly discovers there's more to this incident than he thought. Lying outside the shop. OK, um, could you tell me exactly what happened to the lady? Elderly patient with a bump to her head. She's been sick. She's been a bit drowsy. She's been unconscious. Uh, how, how long was she unconscious for? The patient mm -hmm. is being looked after by a shop assistant who is relaying information to Mark but Mark needs to speak to the patient herself to assess her condition. Uh -huh. So is she able to speak at this moment in time? Aye, could I, could I speak to her, please? The patient, yeah. If, uh, could you put the, the phone to her just to, just to see that she understands that I'm asking her name and things like that? Can you hear me OK? I'm one of the paramedics phoning from ambulance control. Uh, just waiting to see how you are. How are you feeling just now? Your head. OK. Um, and how's your breathing just now? Because I know you're an asthmatic, aren't you? You're not having any difficulty breathing just now, are you? No, that's good. And your head's sore. Is that where your glasses have um, cut you? No. Do you have a bump in your head? We do get a lot of elderly people who fall, um, unwitnessed. And by that point, they may have been lying on the floor for 10 hours. We'll get somebody with you as soon as we can, but um, there's uh, over 100 calls outstanding at this moment in time. So I don't see any information here that she was outside, so I'm going to have to try and rethink this one out. So we'll be there whenever we can, OK? Thank you. Bye. The new information means Mark must change the ambulance service response. Out in the street. And I don't see anything in the notes to say that she's out in the street, unless I've missed it. It's fallen. Yeah, there's nothing in the notes to say that she's in the street um, or that she'd passed out or anything like that at all. It's a very mixed bag of information. So I'm going to upgrade the ambulance. She's, she's actually been in the street for quite some time. The, passer, the, the, the people who are with her have said that she's actually passed out and she's vomited three times. So that, that could be indicative of a, a head injury and they are saying that she has a, a bump to her head. Um, yeah, this is, this is uh, it's one of the calls that seems to have slipped through. It could also be that that's just the start of her symptoms and it may be worse than a concussion. There may actually be, you know, some significant swelling in the brain that we will never tell until we get her in for a CT scan. So yeah, for, for a remote position, um, there was only one option for this lady, and that was, let's get her in as quick as we can. We've wasted enough time here, so we really need to get her in and get her scanned, make sure everything's OK with her. Mark's specialist knowledge means a patient will get help much sooner. That's the crew en route, uh, so hopefully they'll be all right quite quickly. At a canal side near Falkirk, special operations paramedics Ali and Jason have finally reached their patient, a 14-year-old girl with a suspected dislocated ankle. 
when we arrived, the patient was in good good spirits. Oh yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what actually happened? Um, I'm just kind of mucking about, walking about, and the hell. All right. Paramedics from nearby Stirling Ambulance Station are already on scene. She's able to bend it. Around. Yeah. She and has a hypoplastic syndrome, so it yeah. pops in out a yeah, lot yeah. of times. This one, it was just too painful for her to do it herself. So it's just getting a stretch here. Yeah, yeah. And she'll absolutely. be able to just support her this leg absolutely. and this one. Just make it floppy. Brilliant, Sorry. absolutely. So, have you put it back in? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's simple. Oh, that's it. Amazing. Simple. Man's a hero. Oh, I've used to work in surgeries. It's, it's quite easy. Yes. <laughs> wow. The paramedic on scene had assessed injury and the dislocation had been put back into place and the pain relief was instant. She felt absolutely back to normal. But we can't really assume that that's not going to pop back out again because it regularly does for a lot of people in that situation. The patient is still two miles from the ambulance. They need the Wolverine. I can see your lights. You're about 150 metres, something like that. Just make a bit of space and make sure we don't get run over. It was good because the, the terrain on the canal path wasn't the greatest either uh, for a, a trolley, an ambulance trolley to go along. Stones and that, you'd have to lift it over areas and things like that, it's quite a bit of weight. Uh, vegetation was grown over either side of it, so be able to thrash through that as well. So it was really handy on that night. Do you think you'll you'll manage the, the movement? Look, obviously we'll need to lift you into the vehicle. But we do have pain relief if you want it, just let us know. Okay, okay. So we'll the plan is we'll assist you to pop your bottom one here. Yeah. Um and we can support your, your injured leg. <laughs> Put your on that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> There's no escape now. <laughs> Ready, set, lift. Couple of bumps. <laughs> a wee pillow for your head. It's a bit of a big pillow. There you go. Is that better? Good stuff. The lemon towels will come around shortly. Yep, the, tro the trolley will be around shortly. Yes, the cash could have been carried, but it would have taken a a significant amount of resources, really, to uh, to carry her safely. Uh, the canal towpath was only uh, less than a metre wide, uh, so four people round a stretcher would have struggled to carry. A difficult access vehicle makes a big difference in that situation to make sure the patient gets to definitive treatment a lot quicker. In Paisley, Peter and Kirsty are on the night shift. Out of town, the roads are dark and narrow. I hate this road. It's a nightmare to the light up, particularly during the day. Aye, because so you just can't, you can't get past day, anyone. It's, it's all... It's day just over the day, but you can't really see what's going on. Blind corner after blind corner. They've been called to a 91-year-old male who is suffering confusion and diarrhoea. They are concerned those symptoms could mean a serious infection. Mm, this one here. Right here. I've been in these before. Let's see, I think it's that one. Yeah. The patient, Bruce, is in bed, and his daughter updates the crew. Is that your dad? That's my dad. Right. He phoned me. Um, this afternoon to say that he wasn't feeling well. He was burning up when I came in. He said nothing to eat, he said nothing to drink since yesterday. Unusually, Bruce didn't recognise his daughter when she came to check on him. He's really confused earlier on. He says he lives on his own. He doesn't really looks after himself. He's got no carers or anything. Very impressive, actually, isn't it? Oh, really he's, he's, he's really good for his age. And, you know, Kirsty and Peter have seen symptoms like these before. From what we can what they're describing and what we're kind of seeing already, it's definitely an infection. It's really unclear where from, you know, it's... it's the crew run through their standard checks. I'm just going to do a wee check of your temperature, Bruce, OK? All right. 38 too. Bruce's temperature is raised, but it's not enough to cause alarm on its own. To be honest, it was warmer, but of course I had it in the shower. Don't do it. You don't have to give me any plastic one. Like I said, I'd be taking some before I came over. What time did you go? Bruce took paracetamol over four hours ago, which may have helped lower his temperature. You feeling better? 
No, I still am. You think you're getting worse? Are you able to tell us in your own words, Bruce, how you? What's been happening in the last couple of days? I had chicken one day. Bruce mentions he's eaten chicken and is worried it may be food poisoning. Okay. All right, so we can't really feel your tummy. Not sure anywhere. Right, darling, can I check your blood sugar? Is that OK? Is ah, so scratching right. your finger? Lean up, darling. Peter and Kirsty give each test a score to help decide whether Bruce should be taken into hospital. There's actually six parameters that we look for, depending on the results that we find from a patient. Each observation that we take is scored zero to three. Just doing your dad's the observations there. His chest is lovely and clear. His stomach, nice, soft. OK, it's clearly has an infection, all right? His, his breathing rate is 24 breaths, all right? So kind of 12 to 20 is normal. So he is breathing faster. He's got a temperature of 32. He's clearly a new onset of confusion, all right? And his blood pressure is a kind of low side of normal, OK? All the kind of observations that we take from a patient, we get a kind of score for each one. The higher the score, the more likely a patient has kind of sepsis. So sepsis is a life-threatening condition. It's the body's overreaction to an infection. The body's immune system goes into overdrive and ends up attacking its own tissues and organs. Now, this is char characterised in various ways. Uh, it can be high temperature, high respiratory rate, low blood pressure. Anything over seven is high risk. Now, I'm not saying that he has that. The potential is he could deteriorate if left here. Anything over seven, we can. it's kind of high risk. He's got a, a new score of eight, OK? So we'd like to take him up. So it was clear that he had an infection. It just wasn't clear where it was coming from. Right, Bruce, I'm going to get you another couple of paracetamol, darling. Right. OK, see how that goes, because your temperature's still up a wee bit. And we'll give you those. We're going to go and get you a wee chair, Bruce, and we'll carry you out to the ambulance, OK? Aye. Come on. We're going to have to. We need to find out where you've got an infection. We don't know where it's coming from. Hi. Peter checks Bruce's memory. Is it? Who's that? My daughter. Okay. What month is it? Um, and what year is it? Uh, Twenty twenty one. Okay. There you go. Some magic touch I've got, guys. I don't know. Say, you know what I mean? You passed the flying colours, so you have. Oh, hi. Oh. Bruce is less confused and appears to be improving, but the crew are taking no risks. Sepsis can get hold of a patient very, very quickly. It kills 44,000 people a year in the United Kingdom. It's very serious, but it's easily and quickly treated uh, if, if recognised early. So the earlier the better we can start these treatments. Now, we're very lucky pre-hospital in Scotland we can actually start two of the treatments early, high flow oxygen and fluids, and this is what we gave this patient. So we'll do another little check of your blood pressure and see how it is now that you've been sitting up. Chris, just say, your blood pressure is just a wee bit on the low side, OK? You're a wee bit dehydrated, so that, we've just got a wee cannula on your arm there, and we're just going to start some fluids, just very, very slowly, just to make you feel that wee bit better. Bruce's oxygen saturation level is also on the low side, so the crew start him on oxygen. It's one in the morning. Aye. It's a hellish time to be like dragging you out your bed, isn't it? Anybody with a new score over seven should be going to hospital 100%. In fact, even if you score three for one of the observations, strictly speaking, you should be going to hospital. Now, it is only a tool. It doesn't mean a patient does have sepsis, um, but certainly if you're querying an infection and they've got a new score over seven, they should be going to hospital for further investigation because there's a lot more things they can do it in hospital, we can't do pre-hospital. Right, my darling, I'll see you shortly, OK? All right. You'll have Pete with you. Now on oxygen and fluids, Bruce's sepsis score has fallen. Assuming you're totaling up the kind of new score in the house, you was an eight. See it was here, a 10 at one point. His Hi. BP comes up, his oxygen levels come up. Actually, he's only in the four here, so... I would just say, you know, I think he's, I'm happy enough. Post treatment, you the four. Yeah, yeah. He's quite lucid now. It's now the small hours of the morning, with no hold ups at the hospital. Right, I think we're good to go. They take Bruce straight in to be fully assessed. How's it looking in there? All right. Please. Is it, eh?
in Cope Bridge. Siobhan and Liam have been called to help 58-year-old Harry. Harry, Harry, come on, darling. Come on, Harry. Harry, come on, baby. His wife, Lynn, called an ambulance after Harry began experiencing more frequent epileptic seizures overnight. Siobhan and Liam want to get Harry to hospital immediately. So you say they normally go where I am just now? Yes. But they need to make preparations for the journey first. Right, nice and still, all right? I always aim to cannulate as soon as possible, um, just in case they go into another seizure. A cannula is a small tube which can be used to administer medicine. I actually took the doctors about half an hour to get a cannula in anyway. I did it. Mm -hmm. In Harry's case, we had put that in just in the, just in the event that he was going to have a seizure on in the ambulance. It's a lot easier to have an IV access in place prior to someone's seizing than it is when they're actively having a seizure. But cannulating Harry proves to be a bit of a challenge. We'll try a wee bit of cold water in this, because I'm in something. I know it's not your fault, Henny, it's bad to get... I know, no, I couldn't see anything. It's not your fault, Henny. You know what they're all saying, you can't get blood out of stain. We're <laughs> struggling at the hospital. Oh, no, that's tissue. Negative. 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 I don't think he had great veins. Um, I think his wife had said that um, doctors couldn't even cannulate him, that he was really difficult to cannulate and it was an ongoing issue. It wasn't something only I was struggling with. Let me work for my money. It's actually swap. Not getting much at all, have you? Not turning that around for me. Oh, I don't actually need to get something there. Yeah, not for playing ball at all. Oh, pass that in. <laughs> <laughs> I get up. We'll get you out to the motor, will we? Siobhan and Liam decide to get Harry to the ambulance, where they will try again. Just take it nice and easy. When we're, when we're going down the stairs, let us know if you're feeling any wee... Right. Obviously, you know when it's coming, you know. Yeah. We're going to get you lying in the bed, all right? Hi, hi, hi. All right. Have a yellow bar there. All right. Oh. Oh. So generally, I would only have three attempts in certain situations. There is situations which you really, really need to get access in particular jobs. With Harry's case, I gave him three attempts and I got him on the third attempt. Still think I'll get something in there. Right, nice and straight for me. There you go. Right, try it nice and still. It was a good feeling, especially when his wife had said that doctors can't even cannulate him and I got it in the third attempt, so, aye, it was a wee bit of a pat in the back for me. Can you sense when a seizure's going to start? The first one during the weekend, uh, mm -hmm. I felt my left hand side going numb, you know what I mean, pins and needles. Uh -huh. I usually get a bit of mistaste as well. Do you? Aye, uh, and it's like a lemony, tangy smell, mm -hmm. taste, and that's when I know I'm going to have one as yeah. well. Uh -huh. You've been having quite a lot since that medication's been adjusted, have Right, uh, we'll get you up the road, will we? Hi. Harry's seizures have been a recent thing. Harry wasn't having focal seizures his full life. Um, it was something that happened quite quite late on in life. Um, so his, his life has been has been changed quite a bit. Um, he was chatting away to me in the ambulance about um, cruises that he was going on and how he, how he loves going on holiday. And... Two weeks. Um, sleep in a hotel for two weeks. What did you prefer? I uh, preferred the cruise. Did you? I've never, I've never been on a cruise before. That was the first time I had ever been on a cruise. Did you enjoy it, aye? Aye. Uh, you get back to the hotel, you still think it's free. <laughs> You're still floating. <laughs> 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 you having another one there? No. No? no. And another wee one. I'll wait for you to come out of it. Myself and Harry were talking in the ambulance and, and on several occasions he would just he would stop speaking and he would he would just gaze to the right. There was absolutely no verbal response from him. You okay, Harry? Yeah.
We um. Yeah. Is the old eight? Yes, I. Hi then. Can you speak to you? Aye. 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 What was happening there? Another, another seizure there, you think? No, just looking up at the board there. Oh, were you? Yeah. Just ignoring me? <laughs> Aye. <laughs> You're doing a good job there. <laughs> I was just trying to lift his spirits and, you know, keep him positive. You ready? Where are you going? You stay there, Harry. We'll take you in the bed. We'll take you in the bed, all right. Something. You're all right. There is still help out there for him, and he was he was getting help, and he was in the transition period to, to return him back to some form of normality for him. Right, we go. All right, Harry. Hi. Good man. Be up here. Sky, one of the most beautiful parts of Scotland. Home to 10,000 people and over 600,000 tourists a year. It's a fantastic place to live. The community's brilliant, the landscape's amazing. Uh, sometimes you have to pinch yourself that you actually live and work here. It's a, a lovely place. We're very privileged. Being a paramedic here in a large and sparsely populated landscape is very different from working in urban areas. There's always a challenge. The main difference, I think, is the distances involved, um, the time that we spend with patients, so we can be with a patient for hours. Paul and Georgia are based in Portree, the island's capital. They have been working together for two months. We have a good sense of humour together and we work well together. But when it comes down to it, you know, we know exactly what to do when um, to potentially save somebody's life. Where are we actually going? Dunvegan somewhere, oh, isn't right. it? I think it's said, what did yeah, it say? Right. Dunvegan. Just Stop ahead. Side. Turn off. Today, a GP has called in about one of his patients. This is a GP, um, 46-year-old female, uh, query pulmonary embolism. Um, they are advising that the patient has been COVID positive, but is out with um, her 10 days isolation period, although is still symptomatic. Um, and it's just gone in, uh, patient is to go up to Raidmore GA. Yeah, we can do that. And just to confirm, it's us taking her to Rigmore GA, then, is it? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Um, the vegan single man to deal with. Yeah, no worries at all. Rigmore Hospital in Inverness is over 100 miles away, a three-hour drive. This is what makes being a paramedic on Sky different to being a paramedic in Dorset, where Georgia grew up. In Dorset, you'd never be further than maybe 20 minutes from a hospital. So your job is to keep that patient alive and keep them stable for maybe 20 minutes journey time. Here, you're on your own for three hours, usually, um, with the really poorly patients. The responsibility definitely feels greater here, and that's why I became a paramedic, to look after patients in their hour of need, not to be a glorified taxi driver to get them to hospital. The symptoms described are potentially very serious. I haven't been to a pulmonary embolism on Sky yet. No, that's true. I don't think I have either. Plenty on the mainland. Yes. Pulmonary embolisms are incredibly dangerous, especially in the first sort of six hours of diagnosis. Um, I've had experience in the past of seeing patients that have ended up uh, arresting as a consequence of it. So we needed to be prepared for that eventuality. Have you got an FPP? Mask in there as well. Well, I'll wear my new oh, yeah, fancy sure. air, air fed hood. Sure, perfect. As I've got it, I'll just. Yeah, why not? Use it. Brilliant. There's like having air conditioning on, apparently. <laughs> this is going to be hot and sweaty for it will. the next two and a half hours. I know. We wore full PPE as if we had the potential to be involved with what we call an aerosol generated procedure. Um, that sounds complicated, but basically if her condition had deteriorated, we would have had to insert an airway into the patient and also there's a, there was a risk of having to do CPR. 
it's there really to protect us, but also to protect people that we might come in con into contact with after we've seen that patient later in the shift or indeed when we go home or whatever. Hello, Wendy. Sorry about all this garb. The patient, Wendy, is well enough to stand and walk. If you're already stood up and walking around, do you want to come, <coughs> do you want to come straight on the ambulance? But COVID has left her weak and could be the cause of the suspected embolism. <coughs> Pulmonary embolism is a clot on the lung, which is usually travelled up from the calf, through the veins, through the heart, and then lodged itself in one of the pulmonary arteries. And the pulmonary artery supplies the lungs with oxygen. So with a lodge in that artery, the lungs are not going to receive oxygen. Taking a seat there, please. Is that all right? Well just going to pop this on your arm. This is just for blood pressure. And importantly, we're going to pop a, a probe on your finger that will monitor your oxygen levels, okay? okay? And your heart rate. Definitely, Rigmore. Most well, I know, when you, I know when you said we first came in, you said that you didn't want to go to hospital. I think the doctors already indicated that they want you to go to Rigmore to get yeah. checked. Yeah. And are you happy with that? Not really, but it is what it is. It is what it is, isn't it? As time progresses, as the minutes go on and the hours, that clot is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and the lungs are essentially going to die, and she won't be able to breathe. So we'll I... do some checks um, and take it from there, but I think regardless of what the checks say, we can tell just from the way you're presenting that you are sort of acutely short of breath. Do you normally suffer it? On, do you suffer a little bit of asthma, is that right? Asthma, but it's only a week bad, which in the winter when I get a cold. Yeah, uh, so well, this is yeah, completely out of character nice. for you, yeah. Okay. Right, you get lots of oxygen, so that's good. We like that. I'm just glad that I got my vaccines. Cause what yes. would I be like if I? Oh, I know. Let's so you got both, both. Yeah. yeah. So this might not be related. It might not be related, but there is a chance that it is. So that's what we want to rule out. Although each minute is critical, Georgia and Paul have to ensure Wendy is ready to withstand the long journey. <laughs> We're going to need to pop these on your chest, is that OK? Don't expose yourself yet. Okay. We can't just get her to hospital with no treatment. We're not 20 minutes from a hospital. We need to deal with what we've got in front of us. We can't cure the pulmonary embolism, but we can cure the symptoms temporarily. Just, if you can, keep your shoulders really relaxed. The more we tense That's your muscles, the harder that. that squeezes and it gives us a false reading. I know, I bet you I'll get you some paracetamol in two seconds, all right? Let's just see this blood pressure. And it's we'll easier have a look at your ECG. Than done to relax when we're dressed here like this. Exactly. You've got this squeeze in your arm and all the rest of it, so... It. Nearly You're doing there. brilliantly. Are you bringing up any sputum with your cough? Sometimes not. OK, OK. What sort of colour? Green. OK, green. And is that normal for you or is that just lately? Just lately. Yeah, OK. I'm going to close this down. <laughs> No, you're doing really, really well, all right. Despite her obvious discomfort, an electrocardiogram reveals no immediate concerns with Wendy's heart. Her oxygen levels were also very stable, and you'd expect someone with a PE to have very low oxygen levels, as it being a blood clot on the lung, it's preventing oxygen from reaching the lungs. Um, however, not all patients are textbook at all, and if you wait for a textbook case, you'll miss something. So it's, it's really important to, to bear that in mind and realised that actually that this could well be a PE, just not presenting as it would in a textbook. So your heart's ticking away nicely, all right? Nothing acute going on there. We're still probably going to pop a little needle in your arm because you're breathing quite fast, OK? There you go. 96, 46. So we'll definitely get a needle in your arm. Let's have a look. Hopefully something's popped up now. We initially sort of uh, tried to stabilise Wendy. Her blood pressure was a little low. Have you been cannulated quite a lot in the past? Yeah. This is a bit of a stab in the dark, so excuse the pun. <laughs> I can feel it. It's very difficult to... Hang on a minute, I lost it again now. I'm not going to try for something we're not going to get. Not pink. Two seconds, I'll just, just find it again. Someone with low blood pressure is peripherally shut down. Their, their veins are non-existent. They've all shriveled up back into their body to, to cling on to all that blood they actually have left 
in the system, which might not be very much. So trying to cannulate somebody with low blood pressure isn't, isn't the easiest. Uh, luckily with Wendy, we put on a tourniquet, we did all the techniques that should pop up the veins, um, such as squeezing your hand together, um, put, putting something warm over the veins, they can get them to pop up, and we did find one. Sorry, I know it's sore there. I know, lovely, I'm sorry. We're in, at least. Without the fluid we're administering her, she would be, she would be more time critical. She would be really quite poorly with low blood pressure um, and potentially wouldn't be able to maintain that blood pressure herself. Um, so it's really important we carried on administering those, keep her heart pumping blood around her body. Without the fluids, it, it might well have given up. The main thing is your oxygen levels are really good. All right, right, so take some comfort from that. You've not got a wheeze or anything, which is good as well. So your, your lungs are clear, believe it or not. But there are numerous other things that can give you a cough. Um, potentially, that's what we want to rule out. That's why we're taking you to Ragmore, OK? And that's why we're here. We like to rule out the worst case scenario first and then work down, OK? I didn't want to give her the false impression that she wasn't suffering a life-threatening emergency, because she could well have been. However, it's still very important to put her mind at rest and be very diplomatic about that. We didn't want to cause any more anxiety than she was already suffering. With Wendy now cannulated, and able to receive fluids to stabilise her blood pressure. All right, let's get this cover off. The paramedics make their preparations for the 130 mile journey. <laughs> Time remains critical for Wendy. And because of our concerns about the time frame, we decided to change from driving at normal speeds to sort of going in on a, on a blue light. Without the blue lights, I don't think she would have made it in such a stable condition at all. As evening falls, the crew arrive in Inverness. <laughs> I think she would have been much more severe and it would have been much more difficult to treat once she did arrive at definitive care. Patients arrive in Inverness's hospitals from all over the highlands and islands. It's Scotland's most northerly city. And today, it's wettest. It'll wash down the side of the water now. Yeah. Paramedic Heather and technician Ryan are on their way to an 82-year-old female suffering from breathlessness. It's all the information that we've got. We can't get into the care summary, so we don't know what medication or anything that she's on. <clears throat> not a nice day, is it? No. It's not often I've got your high vis on on a day like this. Oh, no. <laughs> and I hope my hair will be all right, eh? <laughs> as soon as the weight touches my hair, it just, like, goes really wavy. Hate it and just, happens, like, eh? oh, I hate it. I know. Inverness is the fastest growing city in Scotland. Need more room, buddy. That's it. Which can make emergency driving a challenge. You don't know what the, the motorist in front is going to do. You have to be fully switched on. Oh, you're just causing havoc now, Ryan. I know, eh? <laughs> Made it. 12 in the corner there, look. Magnet, is it? I'm Heather and this is Ryan. Ryan Heather. Hello. Yeah. So what what's happened today, Magnet? Oh, it's been going on for a few weeks now. Okay. Uh, I've been to the doctor last week and I'm very anemic apparently. Right. So she's given me medication, but I just started it on Monday. Okay, it's so been, you've you've had the breathlessness for a few, yeah, week, for a few, few weeks, weeks as well. Yeah, but okay. the, the walking is getting so the breath it was a week. Are you getting Nothing worse like... when, you, when you're when you walking? Does that oh, make it worse? Yes, yes. So it's making you more difficult to mobilise oh, yeah, around the house? Yeah. OK. Well, what we'll do is we'll do... Ryan's going to do a set of observations and just see what yeah. what your numbers are and see what we can do for you. Yeah, it's just a shortness of breath. Are you wanting to sit up a wee bit? Yeah. Well, sometimes it might help, because you're feeling a wee bit... 
That's there it. We go. There we are. That's better. There we go. Right, you relax your arm. Let's put this on. Let's see. With breathing difficulties, when we attend a patient, it could be several things. It could be lung-related, so respiratory-related. It could also be cardiac-related. Um, so it's imperative that we do our checks to ensure what route that we're going to go down. Paramedics have a standardised list of checks, or primary survey, they carry out on every patient. The checks can give Heather and Ryan a better idea of what's causing Margaret's breathlessness. Right, so this is just to test your blood sugar levels. We do it on three, will we? Carry on. One, two, there we go. Oh, that was Aww, easy. See? see, I can't count <laughs> the three. He didn't squeak in that one. No. We're going to do a wee ECG then, just right. because of your heart condition, just to see if there's any changes or anything that's going on. So we can have a good picture of what is actually happening in the heart, whether there's any heart damage or anything like that, it will show up in the ECG, electrical cardiogram. What I'm going to do, Magda, I'm going to send this off to CCU so that they can compare to see if there is anything new that's going on with your heart that's making you breathless, yeah. OK? Got some bad news for you, Margaret. That didn't work. The batteries are palm breathing. <laughs> I have to do round two. Oh, in it, in it. Cold, he eh? just wants to inflict pain on you, Magda. Cold batteries. We then also um, had a listen into our chest as well to see if it was respiratory related. Um, if I'm listening out for any wheeze or any um, striders or crackles, whether there was fluid um, in the lungs. Just breathe normally. Strider is a high-pitched noise, uh, like a wheeze, um, within the lung that you can hear on your stethoscope, which would result that there's some sort of um, blockage of some sort. There's a rubbing, and that's what we can hear every time she breathes. Are you able to sit forward for me, Margaret? I hear your lungs better yeah, when you're on the back. Oh, Fine. Thank you. Yeah, that's really That's better. What would cause this? Breathless my legs being so weak. Is there any fluid or anything like that that you've got well, on your ankles? Do you feel? Well, yeah, my, my feet are definitely swollen a bit. Yeah, especially that one. The fluid in Margaret's ankles worries Heather. I think we'll need to maybe pop you up to the hospital. So fluid in your extremities, like your ankles, Things could be a sign of maybe heart failure or something like that going on. Have you ever heard of that before? I've heard of heart my mum died of that, actually. All right, so there's family yeah. history. Yeah, oh yeah, very much so. Heart failure is when the heart is not pumping effectively enough. Uh, it's not pumping the blood around the body, and um, therefore fluid backs up. Um, we can see the fluid backing up in ankles is generally the most common aspect. But due to the fluid build-up within her lungs, she needed some furosemide, which is medication that um, takes the fluid out of the body. Um, but we, as an ambulance service, we don't carry that. Therefore, she required to go to hospital. Are you happy to come up to the hospital? Well, yeah, I'm calm, but I'm not happy about it, but you know. <laughs> as long as it's safe from corona. Your chariot awaits, Margaret. Do you want a hand? What, so are your legs? Everything. Everything. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, dear. The joys of getting old. <sighs> I don't know about And then you, swing your legs up. Do you want to help your legs? Well, probably, because they're very right. weak. I can't even lift them. It's all right. Right. I'll get under here. Two, three. There we go. Now, is that comfortable? Yes, and it's good. Her spirits were high throughout this incident. She was um, very joyous with us, and we were the same back to her. So trying to make her whole experience comfortable for her. So yeah, even though she was not feeling very well, um, she still could be able to have a laugh. It was, it was, it was quite a good job. I felt really rewarded by us helping her um, as she lived alone as well, which again, 
um, can be quite scary when you're not well and you're not breathing difficulties. You're, you, you want someone else there to be with you. So we were there to, to take her up to hospital. It was really good. There we are. So I'm just going to put this back on your finger again, just so I can monitor your oxygen. Whether, whatever you want, which one do you want? We'll go this one. The journey to Ragmore Hospital is just over 10 minutes. Well, that's your oxygen saturation's going up very nicely. Just tell him not to just turn the corner and turn the <laughs> I don't think he will. <laughs> get, get you in first, eh? Paperwork can wait. We bump. All our jobs that we go to, we don't know what we're going to go into, whether they're extremely unwell to they're having a, a laugh and a joke. Um, so it's quite rewarding along with, we don't know what kind of day we're having, which I, that's why another reason why I like the job is not one day is the same. It's completely different every single day. So yeah, it was, it's, it's just great, the job that we do. One hundred and forty miles to the south in North Queen's Ferry. Paramedics Jason and Billy have been called to an RTC, a road traffic collision. Information is scant, including the precise location. So it's on the roundabout on the approach to the bridge, the bridge. But we don't know anything about it yet. Reported injuries, but unsure what police en route. Whoever called it in gave the wrong location. So we had a, a few minutes, well, a minute or so delay getting to where we thought the job would be. What did it say around about? Around eh? about very tall. This is all around about, I know. Yeah. Is there one further up there? Keep going around, uh... People are upset as well, you know, and panicking, and so you can understand that. Sometimes they get the location totally wrong. I, I don't think there is another roundabout. Just go left and we'll see if there's anything we're doing that way. Definitely says Ferry Toll, eh? Yeah. North Queen's Ferry, which would be that roundabout. Finally, the crew spot some cars in a lay-by. Nah, this, there's no kit. Nah, he's got his map out, isn't he? Uh, I don't know if that's... Nah. Uh, ah, so airbag's oh. off. Hiya. Hi, sir. The paramedics are immediately assessing the extent of the collision, even before they talk to the patients. First of all, we'll look at the state of the, the, the RTC itself. We'll look for things like cracked windscreens, um, airbags going off, either being in the front or the sides. Right, obviously you've been involved in a wee, a wee accident here. Yeah, fortunately one of the ladies that was in the car was a nurse. All right, cool. And she said that I might have broken it, so, but I feel fine. Yeah, yeah. When we arrived, uh, both uh, the occupants were out of the cars and they were actually just waiting for the police. Um, I, I'm not too sure who actually phoned an ambulance, if it was themselves or a the police. Um, they seemed a bit surprised to see us, to be fair. Initial impressions are that the crash is not serious, but Jason and Billy still need to run through their checks. We go through a set questions to see if they were perhaps knocked out. I remember all events prior and up to, um, just to get an indication of their level of consciousness if it's been changed at any time. Are you injured anywhere else, sore anywhere so else? I don't no, that's, oh. that's the only injury. That's My thumb's fine. a bit tingly. I'll get to that in a minute. That's fine. You weren't knocked out or anything like that, no? So your airbag's been deployed, I it see has. that. Yep. The driver explains he and another car collided on the junction to the motorway. Both cars are badly damaged, but the occupants have been spared severe injury. Nowadays, cars, the, the safety devices are just excellent. Um, you can see some major damage to cars and the people are just standing at the side of the road. But one of the drivers has injured his wrist, and this is concerning Billy. There is a risk. We are wrist swelling um, to one of the, the, the joints in the wrist which just needs to be checked at a minor injuries unit because uh, it can have uh, debilitating nerve problems if 
there was a fracture to a bone in there that we have not obviously seen. Can you just turn your arm that way? Yeah. Is, that, is that okay? That doesn't cause mm -hmm. you pain to do no, that? No, that's again? absolutely fine. Good. And just make a fist. That's fine. And you feel all that, eh? Yep. Is that all normal? That's all normal. No pins and needles or anything? No, it's just the here. thumb's got a bit of pins and needles. Thumb's a wee bit. Yeah. With this type of thing, sometimes you can have an underlying hairline fracture. Aye, that's what the blue nurse, that's what she said. The, under here, there's a, what we call a scaphoid bone. They would normally, it's a it's minor injury at the end of the day, but they would normally just want to x-ray that, just Aye. in case. We'll put something on it and that, but for that type of injury, you're moving it and everything. The only thing I would be concerned about would be to get that checked at a minor injuries. If you fracture across the wrist, um, it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't always show and, and the, an, an x-ray will tell them. If you just left that one to you and it wouldn't heal over properly and it kind of start to affect the nerves in the wrist joint. So a wee bit change to your morning then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I drive a huge amount. Sure. Actually, that's the first serious accident I think I've ever had. Right. In the sense that it was hard enough to make the airbag go off. So I've always thought, I wonder if the airbag is loud enough to make yeah. it give you tinnitus. Uh, yeah, I thought, oh, sure. not. They are very effective. Although the patient seems fine, they complete their routine set of observations, just in case. <laughs> Blood pressure all right? Yeah, it's fine. 174, 84, so the circumstances would expect your higher scale, your systolic, to be up slightly. But for your age, it's not too bad. It's, it will come down as things settle more. There's police arrived now, so cars can be fixed at the end of the day. You see, the airbags take a lot, eh? Yeah, it's quite a bit of a damage, but... I think it's because that's like the strongest corner there. It happens that quick, but it's like slow motion when it's actually going on. 